Okay, we have several topics that we are going to cover, and there are some topics that I want you to review on your own time, depending on what we get done today. Um, we're going to talk about constructor chaining and polymorphism. Um, <clears throat> the things I would like you to review are, I have materials about class diagram, test cases, and Java dates. So, you look in the module for week six, you'll see class diagrams, test cases, Java dates, and fun with dates. We're going to talk about polymorphism and constructor chaining in class today. If we have time, we might touch on some of the other things too, but that's sort of how I see this dividing up between your online work and the in-person lecture work. Constructor chaining. We already have hit that. And the idea of constructor chaining is this. I'm going to set, a, I'm going to set out some rules, all right, that you should remember. And then we'll look at some of the implication of these rules and what happens when we break a rule and so on and so forth. First of all, remember going back to the one of the first lectures that we talked about classes and objects is that <clears throat> if you do not define any constructors, then the compiler inserts a default no argument constructor that essentially doesn't do anything, but it allows objects to be created. If you define any other constructors that default constructor goes away, all right? So if you define either a no argument, a one argument, a two argument, whatever, the no argument constructor that the compiler supplies goes away. That's the first rule. The second rule is that when you create something of a subclass, that first, the constructor of the superclass must be executed. All right? And then the subclass's constructor can be executed. Third rule, you can also call another one of your constructors if you want. So you can have constructor A call constructor B of the same class, and so on. All right. So let's look at let's look at these and let's look at this new example that I have. First of all, let's look to see how I've changed the pizza class and its constructors. I've kept the three constructors that I've always had. One for size, one for size and type of crust, and one for size, type of crust, and whether or not it has pepperoni. But notice how I've chained those constructors together. So if I call the constructor that has only accepts the size, it's going to call this and call the constructor that's part of the pizza class that has arg size and it's going to default the crust to thin. And then that constructor goes and calls three argument constructor that accepts a size, a crust, and whether it has pepperoni. So whenever you see this, it means this object. So this with parentheses and arguments says call the constructor for this object. So if I call this no argument constructor, it's gonna call the two argument constructor and default the crust. The two argument constructor is going to call the three argument constructor and default whether it has pepperoni or not. And finally, the pepper, uh, the uh, three 
arguing constructor is going to set those three attributes, but note it's using the set method. I'm not directly saying, like I did in earlier examples, I'm not directly saying size equals arg size. All right. There's several reasons for this. The most relevant reason is that we could very well have some kind of a, uh, a validation in the set size method. And we want to control to make sure anytime the size is set, whether it's set via the constructor or whether it's set via the set method, that that validation gets executed. So later on, when we study exceptions, we're going to put validation here. And by using the set method, even in the constructors, we guarantee that no matter how you try to set the size for this object, it goes through the validation that's part of the set method. So this is one form of constructor chaining. Whereas a, a class can call another constructor of the same class, and you do that with a this. Now, I created another class that inherits from pizza. And it's a stuffed crust pizza. And a stuffed crust pizza is the same as a pizza, except it's priced differently. So the only thing I change about the pizza, about the stuffed crust pizza, is I've overridden the method for calculating the price. The price for a small stuffed crust is $12, the price for a medium stuffed crust is 16 and the price for a large is 20 And if it has pepperoni, there's an extra $2 on top of that. I have created constructors, though. Constructors that accept three arguments, two arguments, or one argument. Now, I don't have to create constructors that match up with the superclass, but often I will. All right. Often I will, especially if there's no new attributes involved. And so if I call the stuff trust constructor that accepts one argument, it's going to call super. words, on the super class or on pizza, it's going to call the one argument constructor, which in turn is going to call the two argument constructor and finally returns and calls the three argument constructor. Likewise, if I call this constructor, it will first call two argument constructor and that will do that. Now, in this case, there's no extra attributes for stuffed crust pizza. That's why my constructors are very clean. I'm simply calling the superclasses constructor. Now, when you talk about a subclass, the first line of the subclasses constructor either has to be a this so I could get away doing this. Or I have to call one of the super constructors class. So in a subclass, I either call another constructor on the same class or I call the super constructors or super classes constructor. But remember, in order for an object to be created, the super class part of it has to be created first. And then the subclass part of it can be created. Let's look at order and delivery order. <clears throat> now, delivery order, I have some extra attributes that exist for a delivery order that don't exist for a regular order. And those extra attributes are the address, city, state, and zip. 
So I have a constructor that accepts the three arguments that the delivery, that the regular order accepts plus the additional three. And I call the super or the additional four rather. So I call the super classes constructor and pass it an argument and a phone. Uh, an argument for name and an argument for phone. And that constructor executes. And then I can set those other properties equal to the arguments. Now you remember, if I don't put this in, what's going to happen? I'm going to get a compile error. The reason I'm going to get a compile error is because I have not defined what superclass constructor gets called. Therefore, it is going to assume I am calling the constructor with no arguments. So let's go and compile this. Windows PowerShell if I want. That's just a up version of the man prompt. So let's make sure we understand this. I have an error situation. I have my super uh, subclasses constructor not define what what superclass constructor to call. Therefore, by default, it is going to call the superclasses no argument constructor, which doesn't exist because I have I have not defined it, and I don't get it generated by the compiler because I've I've created another constructor. Pilot, it tells me constructor order and class order cannot be applied to the given types. The only constructor that exists requires two strings, and it found that we're calling the constructor with no arguments. Where are we doing that? We're doing that by omission because we did not define the constructor that gets called when this constructor gets called. We do not define the superclass constructor when this constructor gets called. It assumes that it is a no argument constructor. Now we could fix this by defining a no argument constructor for order. Now if I do it, compiles cleanly, but I probably don't want to do that, right? I probably don't want to create a dummy, no argument constructor, because if you think about it, what do you put in the constructor? You put in the constructor the things that are sort of essential to have a member of that class. Or in other words, if I have an order that doesn't have a name and a phone number at least associated with it, then it's not even a reasonable order. You know, someone called in an order. Who? I don't know. What's their phone number? Well, I don't know that either. What kind of pizza order is that? All right. So therefore, if we've decided when we created the order class that in order to have a valid order, we need an argument for, we need the name and phone number, and we create that constructor, 
then this guy needs to be calling that constructor when we call this constructor that has the additional fields. That constructor will set these properties and then we can and create the, the object and then we can fill in the rest of these properties that exist only on the subclass. A lot of this is, is uh, a lot of this you will find out as you try to create classes and try to create objects and get errors when you compile. So keep those rules in mind as you're creating your classes and as you're getting compile errors. That you always have to call the superclasses constructor first, either by explicitly saying it or have the no argument constructor get called. All right, let's look at what we have here. We have our delivery order, which we talked about last time. Delivery order has calculate price, which is overridden, which is the regular price of an order plus five dollars delivery fee. What about the bake time for a delivery order? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how long, whether we're delivering or picking up the order. The amount of time to bake the pizzas is the same. It's the maximum of all the pizzas on the order's bake time. And then finally, we have for delivery order to calculate how many minutes it's going to take to deliver it, which we've determined is 30 minutes plus the bake time. Uh, we said we'd, we're assuming in our hypothetical situation that every place that we take orders from is like within a half hour drive of our pizza place. And we don't take any orders outside of this 30 minute zone. So at worst case scenario, we'll deliver it within 30 minutes after the pizza has finished baking. We have our stuffed crust and crust pizza. The only difference between the two is the way that they are priced. So let's look at our unit test. I'm creating my pizza. This is a regular pizza. It's small and thick crust. So I'm calling the two argument constructor on pizza. It's gonna default the third argument of whether it has pepperoni to false. Then I ask the size, the crust, does it have pepperoni, the bake time, and the price. The bake time should compute to be because it's thick crust, should be 16 minutes, and the price, because it's small, should be $8. I go through the scenario. Notice how I'm calling all of the constructors. I thought I could have called all of them. Now I'll call all of them, which means that I have test cases that test all three constructors to make sure the calculation is right. Know what this is doing here? Bam, down here. I'm 
change it to SCP for stuffed crust pizza. This I'm going to say is third pizza. And this one, I, I should change this to CP. We're going to run this and we're going to make sure we get the right results. All right, first piece of small thick pepperoni. Bake time is 16, and the price is $9. Is that correct? Well, let's look at our code. Is that correct? Yeah, because we're charging an extra dollar for thick crust. I forgot about that. Second pizza is large, thin, no pepperoni, $10 bake time, or 10, uh, 10 minute bake time. Price is $12, small, thick, pepperoni is true. The price is 11, it says price time, it should just be price, bake time is 16. Fourth pizza, large, thin, no pepperoni, bake time is 10, price is 12, that's correct. Small, thick, has pepperoni, price is 12, is that correct? Yes, because a stuffed crust pizza, a small is $12. So when we call that method, calculate price, we get the calculate price method that's appropriate for the stuffed crust pizza. And finally, we look at our orders. One has pizza one and pizza two. So the price ought to be $21. And the bake time is 16 minutes. The next one has the third, fourth, and stuffed crust. So the bake time should be 16 minutes. The price should be 11 plus 12. That's 23 plus 12 is 35. Ah, but it's a delivery order, so there's a $5 extra charge. You need to do this when you run your code. Go and play computer. You know the rules for how things are priced. You can write it down in, in little tables on a sheet of paper that delivery is $5. Stuff crust is whatever it says, 12, 16, and $20, all right? The bake times are 10 and 16 and, and so on. You know how they should be priced. You should check your program to make sure it calculates correct. It's amazing to me, and I get a few of these uh, every semester that, you know, they'll show a calculation for a student's tuition as being, you know, $20,000 for five credit hours. Well, you know that's not correct, right? That doesn't make any sense, all right? You should be able to manually go and do the calculations and verify that the stuff that your code came up with matches what you've calculated manually. And if not, you need to figure it out. I'll touch on this a little bit here, but that's what I mean when I have my test cases here.
expected results. So in one of our cases, one of the pieces might be a small pizza with no pepperoni and thin crust. All right. The expected result would be it should cost um, $8 and should have a 10 minute bake time. Actual uh, outcome, well, did it work or not? It should either be yes or no. Did we do enough testing? I don't know. We have a small thick crust. We haven't tested for a small thin crust. We haven't tested for a large thick crust. And we haven't tested any medium pizzas. So even though we've tested quite a few pizzas here, we haven't tested all of them. And therefore we have some more testing to do. Make sure that we get it correct. As I said before, most bugs aren't bugs where the code never works. Most bugs are bugs that under certain circumstances, the code produces incorrect results. All right. I was expect with even the least amount of testing, you'd be able to catch code that never works, that never produces a correct result. But usually it's some subtle combination. You know, if you order a stuffed crust pizza and it's on a delivery order, you know, that's a scenario you should test to make sure that it works out. Okay, we, yeah. So, be aware of that. Virtually everyone that's turned in stuff so far, with very few exceptions, could stand to test their code a little bit more. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about is polymorphism. And polymorphism is interesting because I can actually do this. I can say Pizza SCP equals new stuffed treat pizza. We've never done that before. All of the examples we gave before when we created a class, we defined whatever we defined on this side, we had the same thing on this side. But there really are two separate things that you can set to be different. In this case, pizza simply means that this variable can accept a pointer to any kind of pizza. It can accept a pointer to any sort of pizza and any sort of class that inherits from pizza. So if we had sheet pizza as a subclass, we have stuffed crust pizza as a subclass. If we had any other subclasses, we could put pointers to those objects in this variable. So when we say this, yes, we can put a stuffed crust pizza in this variable because the stuffed crust pizza is a pizza. And this will give us no error whatsoever. And gave us the same results. Gave us a small thick crust. Bake time is 16 uh, minutes. The price is $12, just like it did before. Now, can we do this? Can we do this? The answer is no, we can't. Right? Why can't we do that? Because we cannot put a pizza in a variable 
that stores any kind of stuffed crust pizza. We can do the opposite because a stuffed crust pizza is a pizza, but a pizza is not a stuffed crust pizza, so I'm not allowed to say that. And if I try to compile it, I'm going to get an error. And it's telling me a pizza cannot be converted to stuffed crust pizza. So in other words, if I have a pizza, I can't put it in a variable that is meant to point at stuffed crust pizzas. But I can do the other way around. Now notice when I do this, I've declared it as a pizza, but it uses the pricing method that exists for stuffed crust pizza. Why? Because it is a stuffed crust pizza. So it's going to use the methods associated with stuffed crust pizza. So if I say it's a stuffed crust pizza, yeah, it's going to use the bake time and calculate price and all these methods. It's going to use the version of them that exists in this side, what the object actually is, the stuffed crust pizza. So even though we say pizza SCP equals new stuffed crust pizza, when we say calculate price, it gets the calculate price method that exists in the stuffed crust pizza and not the method that we get in the pizza. So in other words, the price is going to be $12 and not $8. It's a little tricky sometimes. Now, here's the interesting thing. We have an array list, right, in order. And that array list is an array list of pizzas. Can we add a stuffed crust pizza to our order? Absolutely, because a stuffed crust pizza is a pizza, and therefore it can be held in an array list that contains pizzas. And sure enough, when we go through and loop through this and calculate the price, it's going to use the proper method in the stuffed crust pizza class to come up with the price of that stuffed crust pizza. Now there's one twist. All right. Sort of the last twist. This, by the way, is called polymorphism. Polymorphism is Greek for many forms, because poly means many and, and morph means form. Okay, so polymorphism means many forms. In other words, this pizza object that we have here, this object that points to a pizza, can actually hold many forms of the pizza. It could hold regular pizzas, it could hold stuffed crust pizzas. It could hold anything that inherits from pizza or stuffed crust pizza. Well, watch this. I have this delivery order class. And can I do the same thing here? Remember, I have my delivery order, which inherits from order. Delivery order extends order. So I was able to say Pizza SCP equals new stuffed crust pizza. Can I say order D equals new delivery order? Sort of. Okay. Let's see what the catch is. The catch is this. Whatever is on this side of the equal sign when I create a new object, that determines what functions are available. Now, there is no delivery time of order function on a plain old order. 
calculate price, calculate date time. There is no calculate delivery time on a regular order. There's only calculate delivery time on a delivery order. I cannot, if I declare this variable as being of type order, I cannot call any methods that don't exist on the order class. So simply put, whatever you declare the object of and this side controls what functions you're allowed to call. In other words, I can only call functions that exist on the order class. What we do over here, where we actually create the object, that controls what version of the function we're going to get. In other words, if I comment this guy out, it's going to do this and it's going to calculate price, but it's going to use the delivery orders calculate price method. It's going to get the regular price for the order and add $5 to it. Got to save it. Now, yeah, it calculates the order at $40, which is some of these three pizzas, 11, 12, and 12, that's 35, plus the $5 delivery fee. Right side of the equal sign determines what version of a function it's going to get. It's going to get the versions of the functions on the delivery order. The left side where we define the variable determines which functions we're allowed to call. And in this case, we're only allowed to call the functions that exist in the order class. Again, this whole combination of, of concepts is called polymorphism. Because again, an order can take many forms. It can be a regular order, or it can be a delivery order. Now, why didn't we have this trouble when we got into pizza? Well, because stuffed crust pizza doesn't have any new methods that a regular pizza doesn't have. So whatever methods I call on the stuffed crust pizza, those are also methods on the pizza class. Now, it might not be immediately obvious the benefit of this, right? Because remember, this is just a test class. This is not a real application that we're not going to go and manually hard code a bunch of pizzas that we create. All right. Where this becomes beneficial is exactly what you see in the order class, where we can have an array list of pizzas and we can put any kind of pizza we want to in it. And we can treat it like a pizza. That means that we could call any of the methods that exist on a pizza if we want to. Now, what if we wanted to call this method? What if I wanted to call Calculate delivery time. I could do something called casting. I could turn this plain old order into a delivery order by saying this.
and then call that extra method on my delivery order object. Now, what's the problem with doing this? The problem with doing this is I know this is going to work because I can see this code. This is a delivery order I created. So, yeah, I can cast it or convert it to a delivery order type, even though it was declared as a regular order. <laughs> In other more realistic settings, you're not going to know for sure that that's a delivery order, and you'd have to do some testing. You could test to see if the class is delivery order, and if it is, then do the conversion. But that would work if we wanted to. Can be tricky stuff. It takes a while to observe it. My suggestion, as always, is as you're writing your code and you get compile errors, wrestle with the errors for a while. Look at them and try to figure out, try to keep in line all the rules that I described as far as constructor chaining and polymorphism and see if the errors make a little bit of sense. If you're absolutely stuck and you can't find any cost for it after you've looked at it and Googled it and thought about polymorphism and constructor chaining, then let me know. And I'll be glad to give you a hand in trying to work through exactly what the error message you receive is. Now, again, I mentioned there's a few other topics that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but I want to preview for you. It's going to this in the week six uh, module. Here's a description of, of uh, constructor chaining. I probably should put a uh, polymorphism link out there. In fact, I'm going to do that after class. Here's a class diagram. Class diagrams are ways to represent classes within an application. Customer class has a relationship with order, and these are two kinds of orders. So we have our super class and we have our two subclasses here. This indicates that there's no inheritance relationship between customer and order, which makes sense because a customer is not an order and an order is not a class. So when you're planning through your application, it's good to come up with a class diagram so you know what all is going to be in each class, what attributes and what methods. We talked about test cases, Java 8.8 uh, dates. Some examples. And there is a class here called fun with dates. Fun with dates simply shows you some examples of how you can create eight objects and use them in your program. Imports that you need to put here. How I can create a local date with the value of right now. How I can create a date with uh, a year month date. A couple different ways. How I can compare dates. Remember, we're not going to use for objects the double equals. We're going to say dot equals. And I can do things like what is 28 days from this date? How many days are between this date and this date? So on. This will be useful in your lab six where you do things with subscriptions and you figure out a subscription uh, expires, you know, uh, in a year or three years, depending on the type of prescription. 
You should do lab six using inheritance, by the way. I believe I said that in the lab, but that's something that you should do. Do we have any questions? All right, that's all I had this week. Do take the time to review those other concepts on your own. Again, the expectations in a blended class is part of the work is done in person, part is due online. Well, that is your online work this week. If you have no questions, I will see you next week.